welcome to a special bonus episode of Useful Idiots, where we speak to human rights activist Issa Amro. He is based in the occupied West Bank, and he recently had a harrowing experience at the hands of Israeli soldiers. He was abducted, tortured, kicked out of his home, and he's going to tell us about it. This is not the first time something something like this has happened to him, and this is routine for Palestinians in the occupied West Bank. And at a time when global attention is understandably focused on the horrific massacres in Gaza by Israel, we also wanted to make sure that we pay attention to what's going on in the West Bank. So here is Issa Amro talking to us about what he went through. Issa Amro, thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me to join you. It's my pleasure. Where are you speaking to us from? I'm speaking from uh, Hebron and from a friend's house. So let's start just with your own personal situation. You are a prominent activist based in Hebron in the occupied West Bank. Um, you were recently displaced from your home. But talk to us about what happened. Before I talk about uh, being displaced uh, from my home, I want to talk about what happened to me on uh, October 7th. Uh, there are a lot of videos of uh, Palestinian detainees being dehumanized, tortured from the Israeli soldiers. I was the first Palestinian to be detained by the Israeli soldiers on October 7th. It was the worst experience ever. I didn't expect that I will be released or I will go back home alive. When I heard about what's going on uh, on Gaza borders, I went back home, Tal Romeda. I found out my Israeli settler neighbors, the settlers who are my neighbors in Tal Romeda, who we know each other very well, and they are very extreme, very fanatic, and described by many Israelis they are, that they are fascists. They were in army uniform. And they blocked me from going to my house. And they cocked their gun to shoot me. And even one of them hit me and pushed me. So I decided to go from another route. I did. I almost reached my house. I was at the gate outside. 15 soldiers jumped on me, handcuffed me, blindfolded me, and took me to the military base in Tal Romeda. Then they tied my mouth to, so my mouth, my eyes, my hands to the back. And they came from the back and tied the handcuffs to the point, it's plastic, that blood didn't reach my fingers for 10 hours. Until now, I don't feel in my hands. And I think I have, I need an operation. It's not all this story. Then I was beaten. I was kicked. I was hit. The each soldier who was passing by me when I was in the military base spat at me. They opened the air condition on a very cold temperature. I was shaking, pleasing them, begging them to stop torturing me. But what I got was more violence toward me. Uh, even, you know, they sexually harassed me. Uh, settlers in an army uniform who I know their voice, but I'm blindfolded to maximum and I was in pain. They came and they started threatening to shoot me, to kill me. They punished me in the face. And they say, Isa, this is what you get if you uh, talk about us. Other soldiers did the same. That torture continued for 10 hours. Imagine that from early, from late morning to the midnight, then I was released without telling me why they detained me. And they didn't check my ID, they didn't check, I had a bag, they didn't check the bag. They know me well, they know my politics. And the majority of them were 
my neighbor settlers in an army uniform. They joined the army after a few hours of uh, what happened in, in Gaza. And they didn't care about what was going on in Gaza and about the Israeli civilians being killed in Gaza, which I'm against. I told them I'm against uh, violence. I'm against uh, at targeting any civilians, not only the Israeli civilians, not Palestinians. Every, all civilians should be protected. This is what I was telling them, but they didn't care. They were rejoicing. They were singing. They were listening to music. Not only that, normal settlers, they came and took selfie with me. Uh, settlers' women, they came and took selfie with me, and they know me, you know, and they were celebrating that I am being in that situation. Really, I was tra traumatized, and I felt that it's my last minutes in life. I was released to my house in Tal Romeda. I didn't get any medical treatment, and I was locked in in my house because they, they closed the whole area. One week I was in the house and I'm, I'm living alone. I'm, I don't cook. I, you know, I eat from the market, from the restaurants. Okay. I was with very, very little food in the house for one week. When I decided to go outside to get some medical treatment with, when I had the courage and they opened the curfew for one hour, I went out. When I came back, I was detained again for one hour and a half. And they attacked my house, the settlers in an army uniform. They damaged my food I brought in, and they stole my house key. I was lucky that I was hiding another spare key. Then I, I, I went into the house, and I was told that I'm not allowed to leave the house until I coordinate with the army. How to coordinate with the army? Who knows? One week I was staying in the house, another week. I asked Israeli friends to bring me food and to bring to my cat. You know, I had small cats kittens, three, and their mother was not feeding them. So I decided to bring them food. The soldiers refused. When my Israeli friends from Jerusalem came to bring food to me and to the cats, they were prevented for the first time. The second group were attacked by the Israeli settlers in an armed uniform. They beat them up. Then they broke into the house to search it. They threatened me that I'm not allowed to receive guests, to receive journalists. Then the army asked me to leave the house. I told them it's my house. I have no other place to go because I know what is in their mind. What, what was in my mind, 48 Palestinian refugees leaving their villages, their houses, and they will be not able to come back. So I refused. I stayed. Friday, October 20th, uh, Yudha Sha'ol, well, he's one of the founders of Breaking the Silence, and uh, a journalist, Australian journalist, you know, from ABC News, very famous, came to visit me in the house and to write an article about what's going on in the West Bank during the war in Gaza. So 10 minutes later, army came, police, Israeli police came. Uh, I, I was documenting that. And then they asked them to leave. They refused because the Australian journalist has a GPO card as a journalist where he's allowed to be in, in the war in Gaza. So that allows him to be everywhere. And Yudha Shail is an Israeli, and the Israeli settlers are around, and they, they should have the same treatment. But the police and the army forced them to leave physically. Then I was evicted from my house violently by the Israeli soldiers. And they gave me a few minutes to take some small belonging. And since October 20th, I'm not allowed to go back to my house in Tarumeda. It's not a normal house. It's my dream. It's my life. It's my passion. It's where I do my nonviolence activities, where I used to receive diplomats. Many American lawmakers were there. Many European lawmakers were there. Many celebrities were in that house. The house is the symbol of peace, the symbol of uh, nonviolence resistance, and the house now is under, unfortunately uh, closed. I'm not allowed to go. I'm not, I don't have enough clothes. I don't have any place to go. I go to the, 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 the this friends, that friends. I'm not able to really do interviews because I don't have enough internet. My laptop is inside. That's what's going on. And overall, with so much global attention, understandably focused on the massacres in Gaza, uh, I don't think people appreciate just what is going on in the occupied West Bank and how your case 
is not an isolated incident. This is happening everywhere. I mean, can you give us a sense of the overall picture right now in the West Bank? Uh, to be very honest, I was shy to talk about what happened to me when I see Palestinian kids being slaughtered in Gaza. What to say? I, you know, I hear the, the airplanes uh, and the jet, Israeli jets, they go from Hebron to Gaza to bomb civilians, hospitals. Uh, and, you know, each time I hear them, I say, well, what happened to me? You know, I, can't, I can't compare it. But really, in West Bank, there is unannounced war on the Palestinians. They closed all over West Bank. Nobody can go out of their villages, of their compounds. There is a kind of lockdown. We are in, in small, big jails. Hebron alone, Ramallah alone, Bethlehem alone, and the other Palestinian communities are alone. Not only that, anybody they catch, they torture, they beat up, they dehumanize people. Now, tens of videos of the Israeli soldiers detaining Palestinians, as what happened to me. They handcuff them, they blindfold them, even they reach the point to make them naked. I was lucky that they didn't, you know, force me to be naked and be tortured by, by them. But I see a lot of videos now. Oh, and I, whenever I see a video of Palestinians being uh, detained that way, dehumanized that way, I see myself because I felt that, you know, it was so painful for 10 hours, you know, to be handcuffed with plastic cuffs and very tight to your skin that, you know, it's really a kind of, hurting you all the time, you know, slaughtering you, slaughtering your hands, and you feel crazy about it. And I see that at many videos, and the soldiers are celebrating, rejoicing, all over. So people are afraid to pass the checkpoints. They don't go. People are staying in. They don't go to work. They don't go to universities. People are intimidated in a way. They left their homes from some certain areas. Until now, 20 Palestinian communities left their communities, their, their villages, their towns, because of the Israeli soldiers' violence and Israeli settler violence. Many, many communities were attacked. Uh, many, many communities were uh, not able to get food or to, to get any kind of services. And uh, it's a kind of a war. Pogroms every day. People are afraid to be killed. Uh, last, uh, last compound or last Palestinian village was Zinuta in South Mount Hebron. The whole village left around 35 families because of settler violence and soldiers' violence. They come to your house during the night and they put it upside down. They come to you and tell you, if you stay, you will be killed. And this happened in Hebron, in Taromeda, in H2, and it's happening all over. So I remember 1948, how the Haganas and the Hirguns, Israeli militias, you know, at that time, forced Palestinians to leave their homes in purpose, and this is what is happening now in West Bank. They are trying to create facts in the grounds to dis to, to to really displace Palestinians. So Israeli government, current government, it will be easy for them to annex Area C, H2 in Hebron, and East Jerusalem to Israel without the Palestinians. They want to annex the land without the Palestinians, and this is what we were talking all the time that they will use any opportunity where the eyes are not looking or concentrating or documenting what is happening in West Bank to do whatever they want. And everything is happening under the eyes of the Israeli soldiers, the eyes of the Israeli police, and the eyes of the Israeli government. The Israeli government gave them army uniform and gave them weapons. This is what happened to me. You know, who tortured me? They were my settlers' neighbors. And they are not in the reserve duty because they are very old. So it's happening all over West Bank like that. You don't have to answer this question, and I'll cut it out if you don't want to. But you said you were sexually har harassed. Can you, if you're comfortable, tell us what that means? I really didn't talk about it until now. But uh, uh, really, they got close to my face with their body. And they say that they will rape me, the, the soldiers. And they, one of them said, you are my bitch and I will fuck you now. Uh, it happened maybe two, three times. And uh, I fainted two times because of the pain. I was sweating and it was so painful, you know, to live in that situation. And not only that situation, physical pain and mental pain. And really, really to be very honest with you, they didn't show me any kind of mercy. 
And I was between around 30 soldiers in the military base. And all of them were rejoicing, happy about what was happening to me. And the unit, the army unit, are from Nahal. And Nahal, they are the Israeli soldiers from Israeli leftist background, the majority of them. And, uh, and who joined them were the settlers in Tarumeda and Shuhad Street, who are very violent and they are Kahanists, they are Pingvir. So the leftists in Israel from the background, the, their backgrounds are leftists, joined the extremists to do this to me and not only to me. I know that many, many Palestinians, they detained, arrested around 1,700 Palestinians until now from West Bank, 1,700. It's more. If they, they, uh, they arrested around 100, I think maybe the majority of them happened to them what happened to me. Two Palestinians died in, in, inside recently after being uh, uh, detained uh, after October 7th. Both two were, 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 I think, killed because of torture. Both of them, one is in his 20s and one, I think, in late uh, 50. And both of them, I think, passed away because, because I felt that I will die. Me, Isa, I felt I will die. And they didn't care. When I fainted, they didn't care to bring me a doctor or to give me, to bring a paramedic to me. Isa, I know that, you know, it's, I know it's not much, but I'm wondering if you've seen the images around the world of people protesting in solidarity with Palestine and whether, you know, that makes any difference or it gives people at least any sense that they're not alone uh, inside the occupied territories. Seeing these images around the world, these massive protests, including in um, Grand Central Station of New York, where many Jews came together to say not in our name. I'm very proud of the Jews in, in the United States. I was moved. Uh, it made me feel uh, bitter. And it made many Palestinians feel much, much bitter that they are not alone. And what is happening to them is making people move, learn more about the reality of the Israeli occupation and uh, apartheid. Any small action, any tweet, any 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 visible uh, solidarity with the Palestinians give us energy, give us uh, hope, give us uh, protection, because it's not. It's very obvious that it's not a local conflict; it's a global conflict. Russia and the United States are fighting about Palestine. And uh, everywhere, people are fighting about uh, Palestine, about what's going on. It's it's bigger than Palestine. And we saw how the American administration, how UK, United, uh, you know, the Europe and many other countries gave Israel that much weapon. If you are willing to give Israel weapon, it means you have influence on Israel to end its occupation and its apartheid and to be under the international law, which is the umbrella of everybody. Treat us as you treat Ukraine. You know, we are under occupation and Ukraine is under occupation. If you love Ukrainian, I have a, a, a brother who lives in Ukraine. He's Ukrainian. And he's so worried about us more than he's worried about his family in Ukraine. Because what is happening to us, it's much worse of what Russia did to the Ukrainian. So please, you know, I want a real uh, you know, one one standard for all the human beings in the world. And everybody should know that Palestinians are not animals who are seeking shelters and food. It's not about that we they want to move us to Sinai and give us some food. No, we want to be treated as a nation who deserve freedom and justice and equality. And the people who are chanting in, in DC, in New York, uh, in UK, really, it's, it's really amazing. When they are chanting for free Palestine, it means they are in the right side of history. This is a historical time to show where are you exactly, and the people should choose where they are. Are they with the offender or with the defenders or with the victims? Because it's not equal war. It's oppressor and oppressed people. And you can't judge people when they have no basic human rights. You can't judge them. You can't evaluate what they are doing in the time that you don't give them enough food, you don't give them enough electricity, you don't give them enough water, you are looking them, seizing them, then you judge them. Judge yourself first for what are you doing to them and what are you doing to the Palestinians since, since, 
75 years. So Israel should be accountable according to the international standards. And we are maybe suffering in Palestine now, but really I'm, I'm very happy from all the people who are doing an amazing actions and activities for human rights and for Palestinian rights and uh, for really making a change because there is no change without a price. We are paying the price, many people are paying the price, but freedom deserves that we suffer and we sacrifice. But we want to make the offender accountable according to, inter to the international standards, according to the American principles, according to the American morals. This is what we are asking. I want the people in, in the United States and all over the world to act according to their human being morals and principles. That's all. And how many times, by the way, have you been arrested? Hundreds of times, did and end arrested. But this was the worst. Not the worst. I don't know. I don't. I don't know how to describe it. I tell you, I thought it's my last minutes in my life, and I didn't expect that I will go back home. And I started remember, you know, <laughs> really, you know, I started counting my last minutes in my life. This is what happened to me exactly. And unfortunately, many Palestinians happened to them what happened to me. And I know that the soldiers who did it to me will not be accountable. And who did it to many other Palestinians will not be accountable. Why? Because it's not a individual act. It's a system. A system is like that. It's systematic behavior from the Israeli soldiers, from the majority of the Israelis, and for sure from the Israeli settlers. And anybody is supporting Israel that blindfully is participating on what is happening, what happened to me and what is happening to the Palestinian civilians first in Gaza and the Palestinian civilians in, in West Bank. It's also worth noting that you were someone who has a lot of international contacts. You've been recognize you've won awards it, who knows what they would have done to you if you didn't have that kind of profile who knows if you'd be alive if you don't speak english and if i'm not uh, well connected to media well connected to celebrities in the world first nobody will care not many people will care and no, nobody will know this is what i'm saying that what happened to me is not individual uh, it's not, I'm not alone. I'm right. telling you, I'm, I'm me. I'm watching many videos. This is what we got because the soldiers were filming themselves and sending it to their WhatsApp internal groups. It happened to me. I heard them taking photos with me and sending it to their groups and to their friends and celebrating and all of that. But I'm, you know, they didn't show it out. But many other videos right. are now circulating everywhere. Until now, I saw maybe ten videos. Ten videos until now exactly what happened to me and more and i've heard that there are tiktok challenges tiktok yes tiktok how to dehumanize palestinians and torture palestinians and exactly. tiktok don't close their tiktok accounts my account was closed many times for posting human rights videos tiktok facebook instagram twitter they allow them to show hate to incite to kill us and to do whatever they want because we have censorship in our content and social media as well. One final question for me. Can you talk about the nonviolent organizing and activism that you engage in? I'm uh, uh, organizing nonviolent sit-ins, protests, rallies. I document the human rights violations. I train Palestinian families. I lead them to document the human rights violation. We organize campaigns in the community to do uh, you know public events to do maintenance to the houses to try to make Palestinians stay within their communities and their in their homes. We do advocacy. We do tours to increase awareness. We do a lot of films and a lot of media. We we do legal work and we do a lot of children uh, activities. We support our women leadership in the community. We do a lot of community organized. Uh, actions and we create a lot of facts in the ground. We we try to create a cinema. We create the kindergarten. We create a women center. I was creating a cinema, a new cinema in my 
a community house in, in my house now it's, it's not it's not possible but we'll continue and non-violent means you are you have to be creative to make the occupation costly so i think people who are asking us what we can do be creative and think how you can influence the occupation and make it costly and make it costly on the supporters of the occupation because israel would not be able to maintain the occupation and apartheid for that long without your leaders you know this is something very important so think about how to make it costly for them but use non-violence resistance use the human being principles and morals to make it costly on them isa Amra, we really appreciate you sharing your story with us um I can't thank you enough. Any uh, final comments you want to leave us with today? I talked about what happened to me as a victim, but I'm telling you what happened to me will not make me stop fighting the Israeli occupation because it's my duty. And I'm telling people to make them understand the reality of the Israeli occupation, the reality of the Israeli apartheid, and to motivate them to act against the Israeli apartheid and the Israeli occupation, and without making it costly, without concrete non-violent actions, nothing will change. Isa Amro, thank you so much thank for Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry about what is happening to you, but I'm so inspired by your um, perseverance and persistence and bravery. Thank you both. Thank you for what are you doing too. You are doing amazing. Uh, solidarity and uh, keep doing it. Thank you very much. I hope to see you soon in Palestine. Yes. Yes. And please do make sure you follow Isa on social media. He's at Isa Amro, I S S A M R O, at Twitter and Instagram. It's really important to follow him because he's documenting a lot of the abuse that he's describing. Obviously, he didn't document the abuse that he describes in this interview. But he has a lot of interactions with the Israeli authorities, some of which he does capture on video. All right. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.